The only small-scale structure consistently found throughout the city is the public toilet. Free from the pressures of the residential high-rise, they exhibit different shapes, colors, and details, an opportunity for pure architectural expression. To satisfy public demand, toilets are found in a variety of contexts, but share a particular relationship with the park. The origin of the public toilet in Hong Kong did not solely stem from public health concerns. In the 1880s, they were in fact privately owned and operated as a business. Water closets were only used in European or very wealthy households. Ordinary households used chamber pots that required daily removal by hand, while public toilets were the only resort for working class men. The trade of human waste and its use as fertilizer has existed in China since the Song Dynasty, and in late 19th century Hong Kong was primarily transported and sold as manure for mulberry trees in the silk producing regions near Guangzhou. Businessmen eager to capitalize on the trade built public toilets on their own land. Close proximity to dwellings and shops ensured a constant flow of users, and its location on private land meant fewer complaints from neighbors. For their construction and management, the government levied an annual tax of 60 cents per seat and thus were able to profit from the trade and deal with public sanitation while paying nothing out of public funds. Following an outbreak of the plague in 1894, the government prohibited all future construction of commercial public toilets. In 1904, the first government-owned public toilet and bathhouse was built on Pound Lane, together with Blake Garden the city's first public park. What better buffer with which to control the toilet than the park? If the surrounding context was the first step in camouflaging the public toilet in the city, the next step would be architecture. Fast forward to 1992. A competition was held by the Urban Council to design a public toilet that would be aesthetically attractive, easy to maintain, cost-effective, and suited to both urban and park conditions. Two initial sites were proposed, the Peak and Victoria Park, after which the design would be implemented in future toilets throughout the city. The entries show a diversity of form, color, and material that contrasts with the uniformity of high-rise architecture being produced in the city. One could argue that modern architecture is born with the plumbing system. The primitive hut is transformed as soon as the water closet is incorporated. As these systems of flow become more complex, however, architecture begins to take on the task of concealment, as Mark Wigley articulates in his lecture, Architecture in the Age of Radio. This is an image of a relatively ordinary building. This is not a fancy building. This is just the HVAC system, plumbing, electricity, air, water, etc. And if you zoom in, you can see it just keeps sort of going. And every now and then it sort of turns a corner and enters the room. Water, gas, electricity and information flow inside the walls, the floors and the ceilings of almost every building, crisscrossing basements, running across rooftops. There's a complex interconnected net of tubes that support every space, from the largest waste pipe down to the thinnest wire. The public toilet demonstrates architecture's ability not only to serve basic functions but to alter public perception with the aid of the park. Together, they conceal the unpleasant, making the seemingly incompatible duo the perfect match. <laughs>